Okay, the first part of this video, uh, we're going to talk uh, briefly about uh, a, Ver a Veritasium video that was posted on October 31st, 2020. It's called Why the Speed of Light Can't Be Measured. It's an absolutely terrific video. One of the most thought-provoking videos I've seen on YouTube ever. Really, really well done. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just really briefly talk about a couple of the different uh, tests that uh, have been proposed. Uh, and, and in addition, uh, every experiment that's been used up to this point that has verified the speed of light, uh, he's, uh, Veritasium, uh, Derek Muller, is contending that we in fact do not have uh, confidence that the speed of light is the same in all directions based on all of the um, methods that we have used uh, up to this point, and nor does it seem likely that any uh, thought experiment that could be turned into a real experiment would be able to verify that um, the speed of light is the same in, in all directions, believe it or not. And, and he really uses a lot of really good logic um, for these uh, various thought experiments um, as to why they would not be conclusive. So I obviously would recommend that if you haven't seen this video already, you would want to go, go and watch that first. So that then you could come back and watch this and watch me do my quick rundown. And then the main point of this video would be I have actually uh, been able to come up with a solution uh, to this. Uh, I watched the video uh, many times on the day that it was posted and, and several days after that because I came became a little obsessed with trying to come up with a solution. And every solution that I uh, came up with in, in the end did not exploit whether we would be able to tell definitively that the speed of light is or is not the same in all directions. So I kind of let it go by the wayside and forgot about it for quite a while. And then I recently became interested in it again and I tried a couple of things on paper and I tried a couple of thought experiments myself. And in the midst of uh, dreaming up this kind of sort of complicated experiment that would involve uh, us being on opposite sides of the sun at various times of the year and tracking planets going around the sun because that would be an accurate clock. I, uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I came up with a much more simple, uh, definitive way uh, to put this to the test. So um, what, what uh, Veritasium, uh, what Derek does in this video is he uh, talks about a couple of the different methods either being used now or what could be proposed. One, one of the more um, common ones would be how we've measured speed of, light, speed of light up until this point, which would be start with a light source and send it in one direction and it would bounce off some sort of mirror reflective device and then come back. Uh, but he discusses the problems there. I'm not going to get into them in, in huge detail. And then there's other um, uh, examples of, of how one might feel confident that they would be able to test the speed of light in one direction or another uh, and isolate that. But that's got its uh, share of problems too, uh, which would be either um, using light beams to sync a clock in a different location than where your light source is, uh, or uh, having synced clocks at some central location and then transporting them to some other location um, to verify the, the time that it took for the light signal to, to get there. So there's a, a number of logistical issues that uh, if you dig deeply, they would um, uh, put a... Uh, uh, a damper on your uh, hope to be able to prove one way or the other uh, that the speed of light is the same in all directions. I What I did was, uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, I I said, well, let me just work this out in a way that I can kind of understand the, 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 the basic context of the video. I said, okay, then let's take a arbitrary distance and pretend that the speed of light is faster than our accepted value in one direction and slower than our accepted value in the other direction so that they would possibly compensate and, and, and when added together on that round trip add up to that um, 300,000 kilometers per second. And lo and behold, after trying uh, not one but two, dis two distances at those um, uh, proposed speeds, it does work out no matter what distance. Uh, so there is some consistency there with, with his argument based on uh, doing the two-way speed of light measurement with some sort of um, mirror or reflective device and then trying to come up with a, uh, an average of the two. So then um, so then what I did was, um, and you can see that here, uh, you know, for the longer, I, I start out with 300,000 uh, kilometers as a, as a hypothetical distance and then I said, well, okay, now that we've 
uh, committed to those two uh, out and back velocities that are different from one, one another. Let's, let's plug those numbers into a different distance at 450,000 kilometers and it turns out that uh, you know for our different distances it would be three seconds for, for each. So you can you can look at these slides and kind of work out the math yourself but it's, it's all at this point it's very very basic where you, you know you would take velocity would equal the distance divided by time and that's how we would get the speed of light or if we have a proposed uh, speed that's different than our accepted value we could plug that in for V and with a given distance we could take T equals D over V and then um, calculate what that um, proposed time would be. So there you have it. Um, he, he does take, uh, take down the, uh, the possibility of the, the speed of light engaging in the round trip and in addition to that he, um, well I'll back up a second here, um, what he also addresses is that famous um, photon clock that would be seen either on a traveling spaceship or even inside of a train car where the uh, person who's traveling with um, that particular uh, spaceship or train car would see the phone co photon clock being uh, generated from the uh, floor, for example, uh, and hit the mirror uh, on the ceiling and then bounce straight back down so they would see that as a vertical path and calculate the, the distance that the light traveled there. And then the observer, by contrast, would see it as a triangular shape because the uh, the vehicle, whatever it was, would be moving while the light was going in that vertical path and would, it would trace out a triangle which would be a longer distance uh, of a, supposedly for that same time but then that's where we would have to change the time and introduce time dilation so that everything works out uh, for the speed of light to be constant for, for all observers. So he, he uh, gets into that very very briefly but then shows how that would not be useful a as a way to prove or disprove what he's stating in this video. So I'm very glad he brought that up because that's a very, very uh, common um, uh, topic w w within uh, explaining uh, special relativity. So it's, it's good that he, he used that and showed that it wouldn't be of any use for this argument that he's making here. Uh, what, what's left is uh, something that he also discusses, which would be starting with um, Let's say, for example, we have clocks at uh, opposite ends of uh, going in opposite directions that are uh, some distance away, and you would send your light signals to um, as light pulses or signals or even some sort of electrical transmission uh, to sync the clocks so that everything would be in sync. Well, the problem is, is if you're actually using some sort of electromagnetic radiation to sync the devices to set up your experiment, if you're testing the speed of light to begin with, you can't rely on the speed of light as part of the prep for that exact experiment. So that would that would make that method unreliable. And of course the other uh, method that he discusses would be, okay, so then let's take our clocks all at a central location, sync them up ahead of time, then transport them to opposite ends uh, so that then when we send our light signals we'll, be, we'll have a, a, a result there. The problem there is we have to introduce the concept of time dilation because the clocks would be synced first and then they would be transported when those clocks engage in relative motion then uh, time dilation would affect what those clocks would be reading by the time they arrive at their destination for uh, syncing purposes or for um, uh, for reading light signals and, and, and transmitting. So the what that does is he, he gets into an interesting concept where the time dilation uh, wouldn't be the same in all directions either. It would be a package deal, and he explains that very well. Uh, and at first, you might that might blow you away a little bit, but it it does make perfect sense because if the premise of the video is the speed of light could be different in various directions, then if I engage in relative motion either in direction A or direction B or east or west or whatever you want to say, if the speed of light varies depending on my uh, direction that I'm traveling, then the extent of time dilation will also vary. It makes perfect sense because if in one direction the speed of light uh, is not our accepted 300,000 kilometers per second, but instead it's 400,000, meanwhile in the opposite direction, it's, it, it's opposite direction is 240,000, then if I'm traveling, for example, 200,000 kilometers per second, then depending on which direction I go in, we'll, we'll, sh we'll, we'll definitely uh, show that going in one direction I'd be traveling a much higher percentage of the speed of light than the other direction. So the extent of my time dilation would, would vary as well. 
So that's the second condition. It's a package deal, and that second condition is what helps mask or compensate the varying speed of light so that when we're measuring it, no matter what, it all comes out to be as if it were 300,000 kilometers per second. So that is the potential frustrating part of, of trying to come up with an experiment to do this. Um, so again, trying to uh, sync a clock with light pulses, well, you can't do that because it's the light pulses that you'd be trying to verify whether the, the, the same in all directions or not with regard to velocity. And because of time dilation, you then would not be able to rely on transported clocks because they would be engaging in relative motion, which, which is going to uh, change their uh, clock times, that the, the way that they elapse by the time they arrive at their destination, and the clocks truly would not be able to be uh, relied upon about, uh, on being in sync. So I thought about this, and I said, well, I've got an answer to this, and the answer is um, forget about measuring the light signals, because all of the proposed uh, experiments revolve around the try to isolate the speed of the light signals and determining whether they're the same or not depending on the direction. What I say is since he brought up the fact that the um, extent of the time dilation is going to have to be different if the speed is different and that is a necessary condition then I would say then let's isolate and test the extent of time dilation without having to worry about the light signals because that would be easy. So if we sync our clocks at our central location and our ships A and B travel in opposite directions and uh, the finish line, so to speak, is um, equidistant um, uh, in direction A and direction B from, from the center, then we could take a photograph or a snapshot of those uh, clocks when they cross the finish line for both A and B. So they would be traveling the same velocity, they would be uh, uh, achieving a finish line at the exact same distance A does as, as, as does B, and we could uh, measure the clock time by snapping a, a photo finish of the clock as it crosses the finish line, and then we could just simply text the photos with the result of each clock A and B back to the central location, and if, in fact, the clock times match at the photo finish, then the extent of time dilation would be the same in both those directions which then means you could confidently proceed to um, do your speed of light experiment and verify. And by the way, if the, if the uh, clock times are, are different, uh, then that would be a hint that the speed of light would be different as well, uh, and you've just exploited that by doing that experiment. One word of caution, though, uh, you wouldn't, probably wouldn't be able to do this on Earth. It would be extremely complicated because um, if you know anything about the Hafel-Keating experiment that was uh, done uh, a long time ago, the, uh, the the rotation of the Earth actually had an effect on uh, the results of the clock times traveling in opposite directions. So in this case, we'd want to be in outer space. We're away from gravity, away from any other rotational direction, and we would just be doing a, a linear experiment with uh, uh, ships or devices going in opposite directions uh, and, and tracking their clock times right up until when they get to the finish line. So that's it. Problem solved. Oh, I, I will say this is uh, another fun thing to consider is there's a lot of videos on the uh, internet where you can put chocolate in the microwave and uh, determine or verify the speed of light by knowing the frequency uh, that your uh, microwave frequency generator or magnetron operates on uh, and uh, by looking at the uh, patterns in the chocolate as it's melting in its maximum spots you would then be able to measure those patterns and determine what the wavelength is and anytime you know the wavelength and the frequency of an electromagnetic wave you can multiply the two uh, by one another and actually get the speed of light. So um, I'm not quite sure if a simple typical microwave would be 100% reliable with this but something that's potentially more re reliable is if we modified a microwave and put frequency generators, two of them in there at opposite ends and then set up a standing wave pattern with the two frequency generators, uh, that way you wouldn't have a frequency generator on one side and a reflective uh, effect on, on the other. That that might do it. I'm, I'm not 100% confident with that. I'm, I'm, I am 100% confident with this because it's, it's very simple. Um, uh, the, the entire premise is simple, but uh, with this there, there might be some, uh, some other factors when 
calculating the distance between the frequency generators and the timing of the whole thing and everything. But um, in any event, problem solved.